Hello and welcome, my friends and viewers, to this week's episode of Legend Lore, where I draw and talk about monsters, characters, gods, and other things from D&D 5th Edition, all while giving a small but quickly digestible history about them. Together we'll go over their origins within the game, how they're utilized in the modern edition, and how you guys can utilize them in your own games. This week, we're covering the Catablebus, the stinky, death-gazing, chimeric monstrosity whose very existence craves explanation. Catablebuses were a mishmash of several different creatures, having the body of a buffalo, the legs of a hippo, cloven feet, a long mace-like tail, and a lengthy neck that led to the head of an emaciated warthog, which itself held a pair of bloodshot eyes that carried a life-devouring magic within them. As such, Catablebuses were known to be sources of pestilence and death, surrounded by a horrid scent that stretched out far beyond themselves, and frequenting places that further accentuated their forms such as bogs, swamps, wastelands, and regions rife with death and corpses, such as the Shadowfell or the Lower Plains. Catablebuses were not intelligent creatures, carrying an animal's instinct and wandering around in search of vegetation and carrion to eat. Rumor does have it that when a full moon arose, catalebuses give up their omnivorous tendencies in favor of active hunt, their poison often weakening their prey and making the chase all the more easier. The reason for this affliction by the moon isn't exactly explained, but catalebuses also had dark vision that extended out to 60 feet and a strong sense of smell despite their own prominent stench. Going further than just the aura of particular stink, a catalebus's presence could cause a special sort of terraforming to occur causing the growth of particularly dangerous, poisonous, or disease-causing flora such as mushrooms, hardy but dangerous herbs, carnivorous plants, as well as the decreased drinkability of fresh water in the entire area carrying the monster scent, even if the catalebus itself wasn't immediately present. Furthermore, catalebus is often kept out of sight by remaining submerged in the monk or waters of their boggy habitats, and treasures such as gold, items, and gear could often be scattered throughout their lairs, not because they hoarded or collected them, but because adventurers who encountered these creatures often quickly succumbed to the gases or latent dangers of the landscape, their bodies swiftly decaying due to the catalebus's presence, leaving only items of metal, bone, stone, or glass to remain. Lastly, catablebuses mated for life, and lived isolated from others with their mate, often only raising a single calf every decade or so, with it reaching maturity in about the same time. Calves would often be the subject of capture by poachers who wanted to domesticate or kill the beast for its components, and catablebus parents were notoriously vicious to those who threatened their children. Another interesting fact about catalebuses, alongside gorgons, which are the large metallic bull-like creatures and not medusas, as D&D has a very clear distinction between the two, they are often used by assassin bugs for the gestation of their larvae, resulting in both creatures often being covered in pockmarks hidden beneath their mangy, matted fur. Catalebuses were also capable of being milked, which often was gathered either by brave souls wearing masks to filter out the stench, or blind monks immune to their death ray. This milk, which was red in color, thick as syrup, and smelled of baked ham apparently, could be used to create things such as herbed deadeye butter, or the coveted death cheese and death cheese wine. Yet still, even the base meat and milk of the catalebus were apparently both highly nutritious and delicious despite the creature's horrid nature and environment. It could be possible that the constant smell sort of ripens or further ages the meat in some way, I'm not entirely sure. But catalebus horns were valued at about 30 gold apiece, while other parts of the monster were often coveted by wizards as spell components, namely its death ray wielding eyes, their hearts, and their brains. Additionally, the precious stone Labradorite could be dissolved in Catablebus Tears, which were extremely acidic, in order to create a component for both healing and necromantic potions, such as potions of contagion, blight, or even blindness and deafness. With this in mind, it is believed that there are a small variety of Catablebus subtypes, or at least the implication that Catablebuses can cross over into other planes, such as the Shadowfell and the Ethereal Plane due to sightings of them in both realms. Additionally, catalebuses found in the Shadowfell were known to accompany or herald the arrival or presence of the goddess the Raven Queen, as well as her followers. To hunt after one and collect their head was seen as a ritualistic rite of passage for those who worshipped her, so I could imagine there being a group of raven priests wearing catalebus skulls as a sign of high station or rank, as well as carrying a stunning silhouette. Catalebuses were known to be able to be pacified by feeding them a special fern called Adela, which, when lightly toasted and prepared with other special herbs, could disable the catalebuses' death ray for up to 24 hours. If your party is particularly inclined to not kill everything that they see, this could be a good non-lethal approach. But regardless of all that, catalebuses were also able to be affected by the spell Animal Friendship in previous editions, something I personally would carry over due to how druids like to herd the monster away without the need for violence. 
catalebuses were also very popular subjects of stories and legends due to their rarity and near-mythic unapproachability, to the point that some people would use their image for heraldry to symbolize death or doom. Imagine a noble house that your players are aligning with or battling against flying the sigil of a catalebus amongst a valley of skulls. Many believe that the Catalebus were originally made as the creation of powerful wizards, while others think that gods of pestilence and rot created them so as to impose their will and wish for decay upon the world. This is great for gods like Moander, Tharisdin, Shar, Talana, and even demon lords like Demogorgon or Zugdemoy, depending on how you want to approach the creation of magical creatures in your world. Those of a suspicious ilk believe that to see a Catalebus anywhere near their village was an ill omen that heralded further misfortune such as their water turning sour, their crops withering, or their people falling sick soon after the discovery. Further myths of the Catalebus included the belief that only those impure of heart could brave their stench and tame them, born from tales of warlocks and hags domesticating them and death knights using them as mounts in battle. Now, in my personal depiction of the Catalebus, I like to portray them as semi-intelligent necromantic beasts that innately absorb life energy, their very presence able to rot and twist the soul of their environment. Water turns to acid, plants grow and become carnivorous, and poisonous herbs and flowers flourish into sprawling, colorful fields that warn of the creature's presence. To me, the death ray stare of a Catalebus is best explained as having the capability to consume a person's soul in direct fashion, while their physical presence slowly saps the vitality of everything around them. The stench of death constantly haunts their travels, and so the Catalebus would be more common in planes such as the Abyss or the Shadowfell, both of which wayward souls are often frequently found wandering and freely devoured. However, whereas undead and demons seek to consume souls to gain power, the Catalebus doesn't change or gain much from killing an adventurer and absorbing their life essence. It is simply something that they can do naturally without reason. Call them a negative energy elemental, if you would. Now, if in your world Catalebuses were created by wizards or gods, think about the purposes they would have for infusing such oppressive traits on a creature. Were they made as mounts or engines of war? Did gods bear them as some form of punishment upon mortals? Or was it just an ancient transmuter or necromancer wizard's curiosity that bred such terror? When it comes to running a Catalebus in combat, they often make frequent use of their death rays in order to actively subdue their targets, and their stench would passively take care of those who are unprepared to stave it off, causing those who fail their saves to be poisoned. Catalebuses were also intelligent enough to size up groups of enemies instead of blindly charging into battle, save for extenuating circumstances such as being desperate for food or defending their calves. This offers them a bit more unpredictability in their approach, such as them hiding in a bog and rising very slowly like a periscope only doing so when they catch a lone party member wandering away from the group. The victim would stare right into the creature's eyes, fall to zero HP, and dissolve into dust as if they never existed. Its mace-like tail is also capable of stunning a target that fails their saving throw, making it a great way to set up an attack or other effect from another creature in the combat. Think something like Bog Goblins or Yuan-T who have managed to tame the Catalebus and make use of its abilities. While the Catalebus' stat block in Mordekainen's Monsters of the Multiverse is serviceable, several personal additions I like to give it include a gore attack so as to make use of its massive tusks and long neck, removing the immunity to its gases for 24 hours upon a successful save, as that literally makes no sense at all, and making its death case more similar to that of the Bodak, making it more an automatic mass wave ability instead of something that requires an action to use. These two things will make the creature even more dangerous than its CR5 recommendation, so do be a little careful. And you could certainly add other abilities to your Catalebuses should they originate from the Shadowfell or the Ethereal Plane. Perhaps it can jaunt from the Material to the Ethereal like a face spider, or maybe the Catalebus can even make use of Shadow Magic to turn itself invisible, the party now unsure of the source of its gaze and possibly dropping like flies. Help, you could even give the creature more Bodak abilities, especially if it originates from the Shadowfell, causing those killed by its death gaze to instead reanimate as ravenous uncontrolled zombies. Lastly, if you have a party of a higher level, be sure to include some other creatures who can bounce off the Catalebus' other abilities, namely those that are immune to poison damage and the poison conditions such as undead or elementals. My best recommendation would be creatures like poison weirds, swampy water elementals, shadows, and yuan tea. But definitely scour the monster manual for what you think works for you, and, and let me know what kind of monsters you guys find that synergize with the Catalebus really well in the comments. In terms of quests or roleplay involving the Catalebus, being sent to hunt down and slay the creature due to its poisoning of the crops and water supply is always a classic hook for an adventure. But if you want something a little bit more interesting, here's a couple of suggestions I have for you guys to steal for your tables. The players may encounter the Catalebus not just as its own solo creature, but as a mount for a dastardly villain who is able to make use of its effects without succumbing to them. This can include a powerful undead such as a Deathlock or a Death Knight, 
a barbed devil or other fiend who's wrangled one of these creatures and uses it to suck out and collect souls from the unfortunate, or even a circle of spores druid whose subclass offers them a bit of immunity to the beast's stench. If you want to go further, you could have a bog hag or a dryad who serves as the guardian of the swamp have a catablebus companion, or perhaps a rot or venom troll keeps one as a guard dog pet for their lair. Furthermore, catablebus skulls can serve as markers for high-ranking clergy under the Raven Queen. As such, perhaps the party meets a cleric of the Raven Queen who is on a journey to earn their stripes and rise higher within the ranks, recruiting their aid and slaying a catablebus so as to don its skull. If your party includes a cleric of the Raven Queen, makes it all the easier. Beyond all that, I do also enjoy tapping into the Cataplebus' potential as a mythological creature within D&D, one that is feared and revered by most of the denizens of the world. A house with a Cataplebus on its banner can denote strong warriors, intimidating political influence, or even a mastery of poisons and necromancy that your players could make use of should they do some favors for the family. In terms of magical items that could be made from the components of a Cataplebus, the following potions could be easily distilled from its blood or other bodily fluids by alchemists or wizards. The preapt of proof against poison could be enchanted after being constructed from the creature's bones, solidified blood, or calcified heart, and a weapon of certain death could definitely be made with the enchantment of the eyes or teeth of the creature being infused into the magical armament. And lastly, the armors at the bottom of the list could be crafted from the creature's hide to provide additional protection. I'm always vexed by the lack of crafting within 5th edition system, but I do suppose that's what you guys have me for. And lastly, for our magic item for this video, we have Death Cheese Wine, an incredibly difficult alcohol to produce, but with a hilariously strong punch that makes it worth all the effort. A bottle of Death Cheese Wine has enough to make four glasses, and upon drinking it, the drinker must make a DC 16 constitution saving throw or be poisoned for one hour. If they succeed the saving throw, however, they instead gain resistance against poison and necrotic damage, become immune to the poison condition, and increase their constitution by two points. All these effects last for one hour, and at the end of that time, the creature then becomes poisoned for an additional 10 minutes. I believe this is the first potion I've ever made from a monster for these videos, but I've included the item stat block linked in the description. And with that, that's the Catablebus, everybody. Thank all of you guys for watching, and if you guys enjoyed the video, please like, share, comment, and subscribe, and please do press the little bell icon to be notified of future videos. If you guys want a chance to vote on the subject of future videos, you can also find a link to that in the description as well. And also let me know how you guys have encountered Catablebuses in your games, and also what you guys would like to see in upcoming videos. But until then, I'll see you guys next time.